I was the part of the team, very small team that ran the ARPANET gateways in the UK and was sort of, uh, I call it right place at the right time. Um, and my, my story of how I self-taught is, I, I'm from London and I lived at the end of the tube line and it took roughly an hour and 20 minutes to come in every day, an hour and 20 minutes to go home. That's a long time where you're kind of sitting there. So I immersed myself in manuals and in text. And the strange story about that is that back in those days, manuals were a hell of a lot better than they are today. They are. Uh, I, I self-taught Unix through basically deck manuals, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, but I really got involved in the infrastructure side of, of, of the internet, right? And so when people say a bit about being a geek, you'll see I did a bunch of RFCs around things like route reflection. Mm -hmm. Route reflection is an esoteric thing, but it's sort of one of the things along the way that kept the internet going. Sure. Um, but the real, and, and there were some other jobs after that. I, I, worked, I helped start Ripe, which is a domain name registry, similar to the internet and so on. Um, I wasn't the first guy there, but I was like number four. And I worked on a thing called a route server. Uh, but I always knew I wanted to build product. And so uh, after that, I did an internet MCI, which is how we transitioned the NSF net, and that was a lot of fun. Right. Um, and it was all different then. It was when, in those days, the, the internet was really, the nexus of the internet was actually on, in, in Virginia. So PSI was there, UUNet was there, Sprint was there, and then the MCI was there. And we actually used to meet a bunch of kids, geeks, and we would actually like trade SLA agreements. I would mm -hmm. buy a circuit, we go to the Tortilla factory once a month, I'd buy a circuit, you'd buy a circuit, and that's how it worked. And in those days, there was no settlement and all we discussed the rest of the day. But I always kind of felt that the, the, the missing thing was, how was this thing gonna evolve and scale? And so when I joined Cisco, I worked in the CTOs group, and we had these, these guys called consulting engineers, very smart people, mainly more pragmatists who've been building uh, and I kind of ended up being the de facto kind of product manager for high-end router space. Okay. And we were redefining it. Um, you know, there's a lot of people involved, but and my, my first big project was working on a thing called the 12,000. 12,000 was the real first carrier class box. And then, to cut a long story short so this doesn't go on forever, the real big thing I got involved in was this thing called the CRS-1. And what was brilliant about that was all aspects of building a system, so hardware, we created this new operating system called ISXR, which I drove and led. And this, you know, is, put it this way, pretty much any time you connect or someone connects to your website, the pack, you know, gets sent to a packet, it goes across one of these devices. So it's, it's part of the infrastructure. Um, and the only other bit that may be relevant for this is along that way, I got really enamored with video. I was asked to integrate Scientific Atlanta. And so, because we acquired Scientific Atlanta, and, I, okay. and now it got bigger, and I was a general manager, and I had most of the, the carrier business big portfolio um, and what I loved about their, their technology was um, the complexities of it right? and the complexities of the multiple forms of capture to display um, and I also loved the fact that uh, it took me to a place that I hadn't been before I'd been basically a plumber right I'd been selling plumbing and, mm -hmm. and building plumbing. but when, when we acquired the scientific Atlanta at Cisco the dialogue changed we were now actually in the home we were in the ARPU part of their discussion and the other thing that happened because of that passion around um, video and the fact that I had been so focused on sort of early generation of internet, I got this opportunity to be on the board of YouTube. And that was my, my, my first real shot into the kind of, kind of consumer land, consumer internet. Loved it, it was over before it started, it was mm -hmm. great fun. Founders are fantastic people, Chad and Steve, if you ever got a chance to meet them, they're, they're wonderful guys. Um, and from there, uh, you know, I was, I was sort of building my portfolio, growing my leadership, and John Chance asked me to take on Enterprise 18 months ago, and then this okay. opportunity came up. So. And so out of all the companies, why Skype? Well, it's a great story. So um, uh, I'm very goal-driven. Uh, my wife would tell you that we, were, we just in did In terms that. of like personal career goals? Goals in general. Okay. Some career, I mean, just being very candid, some career, some material, some, you know, more uh, social. I mean, just... I believe that goals work, you know, there's this, I, I think it's a myth, but there's some Harvard study that wasn't empirical that said that they did a measure of people, one, one year of graduation class, and those who had goals, that wrote down goals, were more successful than those who didn't write down goals. Now, again, goals are all different for different people, but three years ago I wrote down a goal that I'd like to be a CEO by the, before I'm 45, and I wrote down three companies, and this is one of them. 
Oh. I'm not telling you who the other two are. <laughs> okay. But what I would, that was like... <laughs> but what right I would there. tell you is, each one of those was not in the infrastructure and system space, was in the consumer internet space, because I, I, I think the consumer internet side is the most disruptive space and continues to be. I, I was in the transition at Cisco where it was, you know, frankly, academic-led to enterprise-led, and it transitioned to consumer-led, and I, I got to see that. Um, and the other thing, just for what it's worth, it uh, hopefully it doesn't come across cheesy, is I've been a big user of Skype for a long time. and uh, Yeah, a little cheesy. <laughs> yeah, but let me tell you the story of why it's less cheesy. Um, uh, when I went to Tallinn, and have you ever spent any time in Estonia? No. You'd love it, actually. Um, a big part of the history is the disruption and what they've done. And one of the questions they'll ask anyone is, how long have you been using Skype? Um, one way you can tell how long someone's been using Skype is actually, do they have a unique handle that maps to their unique handle? My unique handle my whole life has been T-Bates. My Skype ID is T-Bates. I started using Skype in March 2004. So that, and it's, the, there's a great story here if you, if you, so the guy who runs all the database that has all the, all the secrets, ASCO, mm -hmm. we asked him to run it because I was, I was asked this question myself and the answer came back and he goes, wow, that's before I started using it. Nice. Um, so yes, you can say it's cheesy, but the, the, the reality is I actually used it a long time ago. I, I was exposed to, I met Nicholas and, and Janice, I met Nicholas actually a long time ago. I developed um, an idea of putting P2P inside routing protocols mm -hmm. at Cisco. Uh, we have a patent on that. And I pitched it to them. They said it wasn't a great idea because <laughs> it's their core value, see? Yeah, yeah. But um, so I'd been uh, involved in that type of technology for a long time. Just to give you perspective, I was at Cisco uh, 15 years. So I was there when we were kind of in the low billion dollars. We're slightly bigger than this. Yeah. And actually, it's kind of interesting because a lot of the, what, when I came to Skype and, and there's a lot of similarities in culture, right? Uh, we can discuss what Cisco is today, but it's kind of a, back then it was highly product centric. There was a belief system in this case that it could, it could kind of equalize the world by making IP the center po point of it. In Skype's case, it's kind of like, I think it's saying that we, we can provide a, a, a communication services platform that breaks down barriers on a global basis. And they, they used a very powerful disruptive technique to do that. Um, one, it's, it's low cost, but two, it's highly scalable. Um, and so there's similarities there. Culturally, there's also similarities that in the early days of Cisco, there was a belief system that you could do anything if you've got the right talent and the right engineers in place. Yeah. Now, that scales to a certain level, and then you have to put processes in, in and so on. And, and Skype, I think, is a very similar uh, point in its, its life cycle. So for, for me... Um, I was sort of lucky enough to go through that. So I, when you ask, what's the value I can bring? I have been through that. Okay. Uh, I think the, there's two other pieces, which is uh, leadership as you go through these transitions is critical. And I learned that from John. And, we, and John created a bunch of cultural values um, that stick with the company. Those, those values are different, but the, the importance of those cultural values were very critical as we went through different um, parts of that long-term journey. And so I, I am, I'm in the process, and it's an internal thing, but I'm happy to share it, sort of establishing a, a bunch of cultural values that I think are very important to Skype. They're different to the ones that we had at Cisco. Cisco was like, customer is always right, no technology, religion, um, uh, results driven. So there was a bunch, and there's a badge that you, you get at Cisco. I'm trying to focus on four key things. Um, number one, product engineering led company. The way Skype will be successful is its products will speak for themselves its products and its services. And, and you know, I think we have some wonderful products. I think what we just did with the iPhone launch, just to kind of bring you up to speed, we did the New Year's Eve event with 11 million, so 10 million upgrades, 1 million new users in less than a week. Right? And, and just, the, just the pure use cases are just unbelievable. And I think why? Because we're multi-platform. Uh, we're going to be to more platforms, but it just, just takes it to the next level. So that, that's one key thing. But product engineering led. has to be led, must lead. Uh, I don't want to talk about the past. I want to talk about what I want to do, but that's right. number one. Secondarily, understanding that um, we're truly a global company. One thing that really attracts me to Skype is that uh, we were founded in the East. We were founded in Eastern Europe uh, with some incredibly... Um, when you, if, 
maybe we should do this at some point, you should come with me. The energy and, and the way they, they think about life is just amazing. It's not just because they disrupt for disruption's sake, but they actually see this as a platform that could change the world, could change the world. Now to change the world, you need a big platform, right? So you've yeah. got to keep investing and so on. Um, but, but we also need to grow. And at some point, you know, you have to look at that talent pool and say, I mean, if you go, if you go to, if you go to Estonia and you get in a cab and you say Skype, you don't have to say any more. I'm saying Estonia. I'm not just saying Tallinn. So, right. so this is population thing. So, so we're sort of bringing east to the west. Now, why I, I like that concept is that we actually have the infrastructure and the capability to do it. The way people use Skype internally is they've already got to embrace globalization, but not necessarily really realize the full power of it. So that's number two, truly global like no one else. Really be a global company. Most global companies today are headquartered in the valley and they outsource. That's not what I'm talking about. A completely distributed company. So that's second cultural value. Um, the third one is that we got to, one thing that I think is really important is we have incredible ideas. If you go to, and you have some great ideas by the way, and, and I do want to mention we're going to take up your heartbeat idea. I think that's a good one. Not committing right now, but I think absolutely heartbeat is not good right now. We need to put a lot more status and data around it. But if we, we need, there's probably 10 things that you would like to do in the Skype product. There's probably 10, and probably five or six of them are the same. If you go to Talon and you say to them, we should do this, I don't know, ringtones, we'll just pick on one as an example. It's been done. But what happened was for some reason, the processes and things to get it to market and really get it to take off, so they just moved on. So cultural concept number three is real, you know, ideas to real users much quicker. I think, and I, I think I know how to do that. Okay. Because I've been through that process. Last year, I, I, I helped develop 400 new products at Cisco. Different types of products, software products as well, Android tablet, business social software, obviously switches and routers and so on. And so I think picking up that pace is, and then and the last one is a, sort of a bit high level, but is understanding that the role Skype plays is we're in a highly dynamic world, much more static, than, much more dynamic than it used to be. There's a bit of a sense it's kind of static, oh, you win VoIP and then you win the next one. I think all those things are blurring. And so that's the, the fourth concept. And this notion of dynamics, you know, dynam sort of dynamic, what's happening in the marketplace with competitors and so on, I think we can translate internally and really move much quicker. Yeah. Um, Look, I think there's a couple of things on this. One is Skype, in my opinion, is the only truly global communication services company already. In fact, you should look out for a telegeography story yeah, gonna, that's coming out. Maybe we're going to get to that. Go ahead. Yeah. So one of the things we're gonna it's going to come out tomorrow. Telegeography, you know, they're kind of the yeah. only ones who post data. Uh, well, well uh, let me ask I know you. I know what do you think the number is going to be for 2010? For international minutes. For us, as a percentage of total. Sixteen. 25. Shit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do that take again? <laughs> no, that's okay. We'll leave it in. Um, oh, congratulations. Um, so, you know. but that's, um, that's really, what's that really about? So that's still mainly people with good broadband, mainly people in the, you know, in the developed world with, with PC architectures, right? We've got we to gotta move to mobile. We've got to get to the, the, you know, the third screen. Um, well, I would say the living room, really. Right? Um, I think the world is made up of sort of three, in increasingly three modalities of input and, and, and receive and communications. These guys, for sure, right. Right, that wave's there, and we're, we're right in the, in the heart of that right now um, with what we're doing in our products. This, and I think the desktop is still a metaphor mainly for the web and the browser, mm -hmm. um, and increasingly the living room. And that's the other thing we're going to be talking about a little bit more tomorrow is uh, just continuing partnerships around what we're doing with TVs uh, and Skype kit as a generalized kit that can now be put onto lots of different devices. So when you say, what do I think it can become? I think it can service a billion people quite candidly. I think it can offer a rich set of communication services in a way that um, leads to more you know, wonderful experiences, obviously. I mean... There's so many stories of the way people use it. I mean, in terms of whether it's, you know, outreach in terms of uh, education to kids and so on, or whether the, you've got the, um, you know, someone who's at war and trying to get back home. But I actually think the broader play for us is that it can also start to become much more useful. Uh, the way people collaborate is becoming more video-based. 
It's much more immersive. People want to actually talk to each other. Customer service, there's so many different examples of where video will become a kind of the next frontier. I think we're leading in that, um, but I think we've got to be multi-platform across all of those, and that's really what we're, we're trying to do over the next few years. Okay.